Hello everybody and welcome back to another Axis and Allies 1914 video. And in this video we'll be looking at the global rules for the Russian Civil War House rule set and the global Soviet rules. In addition we'll be looking at um, other ways that the Soviets are affected by other rule sets that I've created and additionally we'll be looking at the global national objectives specifically for the Soviets and also Japan. So let's uh, start with um, the global rules for the Russian Civil War and the Soviets. Now if you haven't seen my other video on the Russian Civil, Ru Civil War um, house rule set and the how you introduce the Soviet faction, um, check out that video. I'll be linking it in this video so you can check that out. So check that out first. So in this video we'll be looking at um, the global rules for the Soviets in the Russian Civil War. And basically, it's pretty this is pretty similar. Things are pretty much the same. Um, so if you remember, you it's still, you know, the Russian Revolution happens starting round four. If the Central Powers have taken territory, um, you know that you know all this. So for the setup the all Russian forces and other allied forces in Moscow, Karelia, and Kazakhstan, you know, they are retreated out of those spaces. For the global rule set, any um, of these forces in Moscow, the capital, they will be moved to Urals, which is, this is to represent the all Russian government in, what is the city called? In Omsk? That is like the, um, the uh, the major white faction that was led by Admiral Admiral Kolchak, kind of like the probably the biggest of the white factions. So that's to represent that. So you just move them all to Urals. Any Russian or other Allied forces. And additionally, you're going to want to move any of these other Allied forces from. Siberia and Amur so you can retreat them either to an adjacent friendly territory like that or you can move into your house so we'll move them there and then so the Soviet setup if you remember you put three inf three infantry and artillery in Moscow Three infantry and an artillery in Karelia. And you put two infantry in Kazakhstan down here. And they all get control markers because these are now Soviet territories. Moscow is the new Soviet capital. And yeah, I and mean also on the global map, they additionally also will be put in Siberia, two in Siberia, and two in Amur. And they also get those territories as well. Now you notice Siberia and Amur don't have any income, so the global addition does not affect the uh, starting income of the Soviets. So it doesn't change that. So you, it still stays at nine IPCs. Now, so that's the change in the setup. Um, the only other real changes are... Yeah, that's really... The only other real changes come with... Uh, other rule sets, which I will get into in a minute. But first, I want to uh, start with some. Oh, I forgot to add the uh, Soviet cruiser in uh, Zone 12 right there. So, before I get into um, other rule sets, I want to talk about the uh, clarifications, some clarifications for um, the Soviets. 
And I want to take this uh, time to say I've seen a lot of um, a lot of talk online about my uh, global rule sets and the Soviet rules, and and I'm just uh, really proud and um, thankful for all the uh, satisfaction and uh, how much everybody has appreciated. It. Really thankful for that. Really, uh, really appreciate all the support, everybody. And I hope you guys have been enjoying it. There'll be more to come. So yeah. Um, I'm going to do some more announcements at the end of the video, but yeah. Let's get into the clarifications. So, if you remember in the rules, the Soviets are have the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with the Central Powers. So they are not allowed to enter Finland, Livonia, Belarus, Ukraine. Sevastopol, or Persia, and Afghanistan. If you look up the Treaty of brest that's in the text. They cannot, they had their treat, the respect and neutrality of these territories, and of course, those were all ceded to the Central Powers. Now, that doesn't mean the Soviets can't leave Russia. They definitely can. Example out here in the East. There's no rule saying the Soviets can't invade China or invade Japanese-held Korea, for that matter. Additionally, the Soviets can, if they have the money for it, they can make any unit they want, whether it be battleships, transports, you know, tanks and planes. So there's no, no rule stopping them from building a transport in Zone 12 and picking up some guys and then sending them to either attack Denmark or even Great Britain. There's no rule stopping them from doing that. And yeah, uh, so that is the clarifications on that. I think uh, I'll start going to the... and also so um, clarifications on the uh, Leftover Russian units, so like the leftover Russian units represent the white forces. Um, they are allowed to move in and out of Russia as much as they want. For example, if they have units outside of Russia, when the Russian Civil War starts, like in Mongolia or in Europe or somewhere else, they can stay there. They can they can move they can move anywhere they want. They can go back into Russia. They can leave as much in and out as they please. Uh, they can attack the uh, Central Powers held territories over here. Uh, they are, of course, at war with the Central Powers and the Soviets. Let's see, what else? Um, they can keep any naval forces they have. They stay on the map. Okay, so... Russian Civil War, Soviet rules concerning other rule sets. So, starting with uh, the naval economic warfare and the convoys. So, if you've seen my convoy video, you know how they work. So, for convoy disruptions, they will affect the power that controls the capital, Moscow. So, whether it is the Soviets that control Moscow, or the Imperial Russians that control Moscow, whichever faction controls Moscow, that is the one that the convoy disruptions will affect. Their economy is the one that the convoy disruptions will affect. Now, since the Soviets are technically on the central power side in this war, in this um, game, the central powers will not disrupt the Russian convoys if the Soviets control Moscow. If it's the Soviet economy, the central powers will not disrupt it. And additionally, the Soviets are allowed to disrupt. And of course, the Imperial Russians, they can um, disrupt the Soviet economy. And the Soviets can also just go out and disrupt Allied convoys. Such as this British one over here. They can use their forces to disrupt those. 
Okay, so that's uh, Naval Economic Warfare. And, uh, yes. Last one would be, another one is China. So if you've seen the global video and the China Warlords video, you'll know that um, Germany controls the southern Chinese factions uh, in Canton, Yunnan, and Chongqing. So you know that the Germans control the southern factions down there. Now let me set them up really quickly. Give them some units. Yeah. So, once the Soviets enter the war, or enter the game, really, at the beginning of any round, the German player can choose to stop supporting the southern Chinese faction and instead have the Soviets support them. And so in that case, all the German units and markers would be taken off the map and they would be replaced with, let me just grab these, Soviet units and Soviet markers. And now the Soviets control that faction. Yeah. Um, so all these um, rules will be in a document that will be found in the description of this video, a link to download in the description of the video. Um, you'll also find in that description a hint or a teaser to my next house rule set. So let's uh, look at some, now let's look at national objectives. If you've seen my national objective video, you'll know all the other European, all the uh, regular out-of-box game powers. They have uh, national objectives, so clearly J the Soviets and also Japan, since they're new factions, they would also have national objectives. And you know that I've created little player aid cards down here. So now I have them for the Soviet Russian Republic and the Empire of Japan. So it just has their, you know, unit costs, um, turn sequence, the special rules, you know, the Soviets can't enter the certain following territories. Yeah, that's in the, um, on the back we have the national objectives. So we have a little description here for the Soviets, the little motto, and then there are national objectives over here. And then for the same for Japan, a little motto and their national objectives. So yeah, and you can find a link to uh, download these, um, download those files in this video as well. And you'll also find a link to um, the global edition of the national objectives. It'll look like this. It'll list all the national objectives for all the powers, including Japan. And um, it also includes some optional um, German global objectives. Uh, all the other powers aren't affected for the um, global edition except for Germany. Uh, this is to give them a little bit of boost. Um, you know, it has to deal with things in the Pacific mostly and the Americas. Those are optional, of course. And yeah, uh, that is it. Um, I'll just end this video with a couple of quick announcements. Um, yeah, another uh, house rule set will be coming out soon teaser for that in the Soviet rules and um, yeah I'll be coming up with another video but before that another video will be coming out a quick little um, more of a discussion type video concerning house rules in general and yeah that is it uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video I know it's a lot of um, little specific clarifications um, also I will be throwing in the image that I used for the Soviet roundels. This is the uh, flag of the um, Bolshevik movement. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it all. Um, 
I'll see you guys next time. And until then, enjoy uh, my games. Enjoy the house rules. I hope you guys enjoy it. And I really appreciate all the feedback and the uh, enjoyment that you guys have had with these. Alright, see you guys soon. Bye. Bye.